Hi. My name is Sarah Wright, and I am the Associate Curator for Family and Youth Programs here at Gilcrease Museum. And I want to welcome you to From My Point of View. Uh, this is a program that invites scholars, artists, historians, and cultural figures to share topics of interest relating to Gilcrease's museum's collection and special exhibitions. Our featured scholar today is Mark Dolph. Gilcrease Museum's Associate Curator of History and Curator of the Black Bodies and Propaganda Exhibition on display right now until July 16th. Mark is a native Oklahoman. Although as a child he lived in Arizona, New Mexico before his family returned to the state and settled in Midwest City. He earned his Bachelor's of Business Administration degree with a major in marketing from the University of Central Oklahoma in Edmond. After 20 plus years in sales, Mark and his family returned to Tulsa in 2001, finding that he wanted to spend as much time as possible at Gilcrease Museum. He became a volunteer, museum volunteer in 2004, serving as a docent, a Kravis facilitator, and outreach presenter. In 2009, Mark earned his master's degree in history from the University of Tulsa with an emphasis on the history of Oklahoma and the American West. His master's thesis was recognized in 2010 by the Oklahoma Historical Society as the outstanding thesis of Oklahoma history. After serving Gilcrease as a volunteer for six years, Mark was hired as the museum's first director of volunteer services in 2010 and in October 2015 we were so pleased to have him named as Associate Curator of History. In addition to listening to jazz, and you know he is a pure jazz aficionado, um, with every opportunity and I listen to it, our, our um, offices are right next to each other, I hear jazz. <laughs> and Mark is also an adjunct instructor uh, at Tulsa Community College where he teaches American history. Please help me welcome Mark Dolphin. Thank you, Sarah. Turn that off. Um, and thank you for coming out today. It's always a challenge to build an audience in the summer, so I appreciate you making my day today. Before I get started, I want to thank a few people that helped make this exhibit, The Power of Posters, possible. If you are familiar with our collection at Gilcrease Museum, you know that it would be a real challenge for us to mount an exhibit on World War I material. We have very, very little. In fact, there's only one object in the exhibit uh, that is from the Gilcrease Museum collection. The 25 posters that make up the exhibit, the power of posters, are from the McFarland Library Special Collections. So I want to thank Mark Carlson and his group over there for allowing us to take those out of the library. That doesn't happen very often. Now, once I had selected the 25 posters that I wanted to have in the exhibit, I was confronted with a problem. Only seven of them were suitable for exhibit. All the rest, the other 18, required some degree of conservation. Uh, Fortunately, we have one of my favorite people in the world now who came to us from Poland by way of Ireland, Joanna Didick, our chief conservator. She is a wizard with paper conservation. And what she did with these posters, I wish I could show you befores and afters, because she took objects that are now approximately 100 years old. They were never meant to last this long, to be in an exhibit in 2017. And she made it possible for us to put those on exhibit. And I'll point out a couple of examples, uh, both in my presentation today, and I invite any of you that are interested after the presentation, approximately one o'clock, we'll go down to the exhibit and we can, we can ramble around and, and, and further discuss these wonderful posters. So without Joanna, even with the loan of the material from McFarland Library, we could not have done this exhibit. And then once she spent about 100 hours conserving these 18 posters, they had to be framed. And we used Ziegler's. They did a wonderful job, often on very short notice, because 
these exhibits always become a mad scramble at the end, and the framers, they get it last, and they did a great job. Uh, and then finally, I want to thank Charles Myers. He's a fellow Tolson, uh, lifelong Tolson. He is a great supporter of both the University of Tulsa and Gilcrease Museum, but he is also my go-to guy on Militaria. And he has a wonderful collection of all things American military from the last third of the 19th century up through the first third or so of the 20th century. And he's adding more all the time. In fact, all of the artifacts that you see in the exhibit uh, are from Charles's collection. And each time I would see Charles, he said, oh, Mark, I've got a new object. You really need to see this. We need to add it to the collection. Finally, I got to the point, I said, Charles, I love you, but they're going to fire me if I bring one more item back into this uh, exhibition. We have limited space. But thank you, Charles. You really helped flush out uh, the exhibit. It's much better for your objects. And again, thank all of you for coming today. Now, my kind of signature poster for the exhibit is what you see here. And my motivation in bringing this exhibit to fruition was to first commemorate the centenary, the 100th anniversary, of American entry into World War I. The exhibit here at Gilcrease Museum opened on April 7th of this year. That was one day. I wish we could have done the program on Thursday, April 6th, which is when President Wilson's uh, declaration of war took effect against Germany. But I wanted to somehow commemorate that. Again, the posters I thought would be a good way to do it. And what I wanted to do with those posters is to show audiences today, 2017, Tulsa, Oklahoma, what it was like to be an American here on the home front 2000, in, in 1917, 1918. None of us have any living memory of World War I. A few of us may have family members that served, but they're probably long since passed. Uh, so we don't have that connection to this event. Um, one of the most significant events, I think, in, in, in American history. It, it helped the United States become a world power. So how could we do that? Well, with these posters, I hope to show you what it was like to be an American, whether you were in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Los Angeles, Chicago, Boston, New York, wherever it was during the war years. And this poster, I think, does a great job of that. The message is, fight or buy bonds. Now, if you're a young man, you're going to go fight. But the rest of us, old guys like me, women, they stayed at home. They're on the home front. But as Wilson tried to uh, position the war, it's total war. Everyone has a role. So you're going to see recruiting posters today. But you're also going to see posters aimed at non-combatants, women, other folks that were not asked to go fight, but they're going to have a role, a, a role to play in helping support the war effort. And one last kind of uh, mention before I get into the, the actual program. I mentioned that the exhibit, the Power of Posters, has 25 posters. You're going to see more than just as what is in that exhibit. Uh, the University of Tulsa has about 250 posters in their collection. You can go to their McFarland website and you can see them. They're mostly American posters, but there are some British and French posters. But during the American involvement in the war, the Committee on Public Information, that was an organ within the United States government, produced an estimated 2,000 posters. Okay, so I have less than 1% of those represented in the exhibit. So I want to show you some others that I personally find uh, fun, but as, as well very instructional as to what was going on. Now, the 800-pound gorilla in this program is this word propaganda. As I began to talk about this exhibit here among staff, I could see eyes get big and go, oh, what's Dolph up to now? Propaganda has a lot of baggage. And admit it, it's mostly negative, right? Okay, we don't think of propaganda as necessarily a positive a term. I'm going to ask you, at least for today, for the next 45 minutes or so, to at least accept it in a more or less neutral way, and hopefully I can, I can explain why. 
So, how should we define propaganda? Well, I'm going to suggest that propaganda can be defined as the dissemination or propagation of information by organized groups or governments. Now, in the case of what we're going to talk about today, it's governments and, in our examples today, the American federal government. But I personally consider advertising as a form of propaganda. And in fact, what the Madison Avenue, the Mad Men of the 1920s put into great effect after the war, they learned from what these posters were doing. Uh, and I'll suggest that one way to understand these posters is to think about them as pushing emotional buttons. The designers of these posters combined very powerful graphics with often very little text, but they push both conscious and subconscious emotional buttons that all of us have, whether we recognize it or not. Because what's happening in the 19-teens is the science of human behavior is becoming recognized as very important as, and as a way to, and I'll use the word, manipulate humans to do what the folks that are really good at propaganda wanted them to do. Uh, Edward Bernays, who becomes known as the father of American public relations, a lot of his techniques are going to be incorporated into both the design and the textual information that's presented in these posters. And this is a nice example. It's a very early poster from uh, the war. Note the date, April 19th, 1917. Why is that significant? That's two weeks to the day that the United States entered the war. That's also, for those of you that are New Englanders, that's Patriot's Day. And these posters are full of icons. And by icons, I mean symbols that have significant meaning to large numbers of people. So here's, there's two icons here in this poster. First, the obvious is the American flag. For Americans, that's a, a very important icon. It has meaning, it's, it's our patriotism, it's our love of country. But then the image is another icon very much familiar to those in New England, Patriot's Day. If you've run the Boston Marathon, you know it's always on Patriot's Day, or as close as they can get it, April 19th. Wake up America. Who's waking up America? It's someone like Paul Revere. One by, if by land, two if by sea. Two weeks after American entry, the United States had tried to remain neutral, very, very much so, for the first nearly three years of the war. Now it's time to wake up. There's a threat, we have to confront it. The information presented through propaganda can range from completely true and factual, to partially true with selected facts, to completely and intentionally false. It runs in a continuum. There are very positive uses of propaganda. Think of public health campaigns. Eliminate venereal disease. In smoking, those, most of us I think would agree, those are positive uses of propaganda. To the other extreme, denial of the Holocaust. Very evil, in my opinion, use of propaganda. So propaganda ranges. Advertising. We probably all agree body odor is bad. How do you combat that? The odorant and the propagandist, the advertising campaign, is to convince you to buy a certain kind of deodorant. Here we have a wonderful example. I love this poster. This is not in the exhibit. Done by the American Red Cross. This is completely true. Our boys need socks. Our soldiers in Europe need socks. If you're a woman on the home front, how can you help? You can knit your bit. You can knit socks for the soldiers. And think of this exercise, this campaign, as involving everyone. It's total war. Everyone has a role to play. The ultimate objective of any propaganda campaign is to, number one, shape public opinion. Secondly, to influence behavior. 
Here is a poster. It's in the exhibit. I think it's one of the more powerful posters. But if you're alive in 2017, you probably don't recognize some of the iconography that a person in 1917 would have. So let's kind of go through it quickly. First of all, the visual image. That's a German soldier. How do we know? Well, in 1917, you would have immediately recognize the spike helmet, the pickle hob helmet, pointed helmet, as identifying that soldier as a German. And then he's also got a real bushy mustache. You could see it particularly in the exhibit. Identifying this person as a German soldier. The, the tagline there at the top, remember Belgium. Well, in August of 1914, when the Germans invaded France. They did so by moving through neutral Belgium first, through the north, and attacked France uh, from the north to avoid some of their fortifications. This was reported in American newspapers of the day as the Rape of Belgium. You don't need to say Rape of Belgium in the poster to someone in 1917. Remember Belgium, and they see the German soldier leading a young girl away. It's all you need to know. So it's shaping public opinion. The Germans are bad. They're brutal. They're barbaric. Influence behavior by Liberty Bonds. This is a very effective poster. This epitomizes what I think is the art of propaganda, whether you agree with the message or not. To be effective, propaganda posters must be simple and direct. That last one was pretty direct. An American artist that was involved in the uh, poster campaigns with the Committee on Public Information during the Great War suggested, and I love this quote, it's the best one I've come across, the poster should be to the eye what the command is to the ear that the image should convey the message just as the spoken word does to the ear. So think about that quote as we go through. How does the poster command like the voice does to the ear? And another poster, not in the exhibit, but I think, again, one of the most effective posters I've ever seen for what it's trying to do. Note the date, June 1915. <coughs> How is that significant? Two, two reasons. First of all, June 1915 was one month after the sinking of the Lusitania, the luxury cruise ship, the Lusitania. It was sunk by a German submarine off the coast of Ireland. 1,198 people perished as a result, including 128 Americans. June 1915 is 22 months before the United States enters the war. Do not fall into the trap that so many people do, oh, the, the Germans sunk the Lusitania that brought the United States into the war. No, it didn't. The United States, from President Wilson on down, wanted to remain neutral, to stay out of the war. But this poster, created by an American illustrator, June 1915, was used to recruit. The armed services had always recruited. We had a volunteer army at the time. This is a recruiting poster. So if you're alive in 1915, you know exactly what this image refers to. This is a woman clutching her baby, sinking to the depths of the Atlantic off the coast of Ireland. In fact, a woman clutching a baby was on the docks of Dublin uh, as part of their recovery, not... Uh, survival, but a, a, a body. And it was, this image was published in newspapers around the world. So if you're an American, 1915, you know it, it immediately what this references. In many ways, this does much more than recruit young men into the armed forces. It begins this process of demonizing the Germans. It begins the process of building a case for American entry into the war. These posters are working on many levels, the best ones, both consciously as well as subconsciously. So why did President Wilson need to unleash the power of posters? And that's the name of the exhibit, the power of posters. They are, I hope by the end of this discussion today you'll agree with me, they are very powerful. He needed to convince Americans 
that it, the time for neutrality was over. It is critical for national survival to enter the war. So he has a selling job to do because Wilson, as much as the American population, wanted to stay out of the war. He had campaigned for re-election in 1916 with the, uh, the slogan, he kept us out of the war. And, and I truly believe, at least for the first couple of years, he wanted to stay out of the war. He did everything he could do as a diplomat to end the war before it drug the Americans into it. So that's the first goal. Well, if you're going to enter the war, you need to do it as a united nations. We have examples in our history uh, where a president took the nation to war without popular support. And we only need to go back to Lyndon Johnson and Vietnam as, as an example of a war that was not popularly supported. Regardless of how you feel about that war, the, the bulk of Americans did not support it. Now, if you're going to go to war, you've got to recruit an army that hopefully will win the war. When the war broke out, or when, I'm sorry, I should say when the United States entered the war in uh, April of 1917, our standing army was approximately 200,000 men. By the time the armistice is signed in November of 1918, 4.7 million Americans will have served in the war. So it was a huge effort to build the army, the navy necessary to carry out the war, particularly a war that's across the Atlantic. It's not on our home front, it's in Europe. Now, you're going to recruit these young men, you're going to bring the nation to war, you need to demonize the enemy. This is not unusual. Every country that goes to war has to make the enemy someone these young men are willing to kill. You vilify them, you demonize them, you make them less than human. And as we get into some of these examples, you'll see that that was very effectively done with the Germans. We already saw one example, remember Belgium. One effort, and we'll see some examples, is to encourage the conservation of food and other resources. A very successful effort, particularly in food conservation. And then, the bulk of the examples in both the exhibit and what we'll talk about today, at least at one level, are promoting liberty bonds. What's a liberty bond? It was the way that two-thirds of the cost of the war were paid for. When the war started, Secretary of the Treasury McAdoo had to decide how to finance the war. He could tax, he could print money, inflate the economy, or what they decided to do was a combination of selling bonds so that people like you and I are paying for the war and the government will repay us over time with interest. Two-thirds cost of war, approximately $17 billion, was raised, and those are 19, 17, 18 dollars. Uh, 17 billion dollars were raised to support the war effort. The other third came from taxes, primarily on very high income Americans. Made possible by the recently passed 16th Amendment. So that was already in place, and it was a method to finance the war. Where would Americans on the home front in Tulsa, in Oklahoma City, Chicago, Los Angeles, where would they have encountered these posters during the war years? And this is one of my favorite posters. Um, on one level, it's a very friendly, kind of happy image. Today, buy that bond. I don't know if that's a rising sun in the morning reminding you to buy the bond or a setting sun in the evening before you go to bed, buy your bond. But I've become, over time, as I've learned more about this campaign effort, to look at this, again, through the eyes of 2017. And all of us do that. We look at the past through our experiences in the present. And this is very Orwellian to me. This is the omnipresence of surveillance, not so much by the government, although there was government surveillance uh, during the war, but by our neighbors. I see you haven't bought a bond today. I see you're not saving food. There was this peer pressure that became nearly hysterical and will lead to uh, the oppression of civil rights, the uh, 
persecution, I'll use that word, of German Americans during the war years. And it didn't end on November 11th, 1918. It's one of the very negative consequences of this entire propaganda campaign is that it creates an environment that is very conducive to um, oppression, suppression, uh, and persecution. But I do love this poster. So where do they see them? Anywhere and everywhere. At train and bus stations, courthouses, post offices, libraries, at the workplaces, in schools, theaters, concert halls. Every conceivable public place where people gathered, you would see these posters. During the two plus years the United States was in the war, from April of 1917 into the early part of 1919, after the war had ended, but there was still this campaign underway, the United States printed more than 20 million posters. They were everywhere. You could not escape them. Why? It's the most, at the time, the most effective means of mass communications there was. There had been newspapers. Film is in its infancy. Film theater, cinema won't take off until the 1920s. Radio's not there yet. Again, it's something of the 1920s. Obviously, television. And these little objects right here are still a long ways away. Uh, so the poster is the most effective means to communicate these kinds of messages to vast mass audiences. So back to the, my kind of signature poster. Um, we all have a role to play in this war. You're either a soldier fighting or you have some role here on the home front. You're gonna see several examples by Howard Chandler Christie. Um, he becomes, I think, one of the premier illustrators for these kinds of posters. In fact, in our collection, we have some Howard Chandler Christie paintings. Uh, we have a portrait of Thomas Gilcrease and one that Christie did of his daughter, Decine. Then we have a bizarre, we need to have it on display, very large painting of the signing of the American Constitution. And it has everybody that signed the Constitution in one room at one time, which was not possible. That didn't happen. And then there's allegorical figures. It's very large. We need to have it on display. We'd have a lot of fun with that. He is a, a instrumental in this effort. And I should tell you that all of the illustrators that were involved in this campaign volunteered their services. Within a week of American entry in the war, Wilson, President Wilson, went to a fellow by the name of George Creel and asked him to form this propaganda uh, group under the Committee of Public Information. That's a very benign sounding title. Everybody's for public information. And these posters, propaganda posters, are one tool that they used. There were others, but this, this was one of the tools. And Christie, along with James Montgomery Flagg produced, I think, some of the most enduring, iconic images that came out of the war effort. All of us have been, seen this poster. Maybe not as it was originally used as a recruiting poster. You see it today on t-shirts. I want you to buy such and such a product, or I want you to do this or that. Uncle Sam had long been used in um, American uh, these were propaganda uh, all the way back to the Civil War, but never in the role as recruiter for the armed services. And the story is that James Montgomery Flagg was wanting to do a recruiting poster for this effort. He didn't have a model, so he put a mirror up, put on the top hat, and he looked in the mirror, painted himself. Becomes iconic. We talk about icons. That's an icon. Okay. Another one of his works, this again is one of my favorites, it's not in the exhibit, but I couldn't do this program without showing you this. It is extremely effective. In fact, I don't even think you need any text on this one to be effective. Here we have a guy, he looks like a Wall Street banker. He's walking down the street, he's probably just picked up his morning newspaper and he's read the headlines that have made him so angry. He's thrown off his hat, he's yanking off his jacket, his, finches, his fists are clenched. Why? Because the headline says, Huns kill women and children. 
Huns, that's a derogatory, pejorative use uh, or, or word for Germans at the time. Now, Germans were not Huns. This is a reference to Attila the Hun, the uh, folks from Central Asia that invaded Europe in the 4th and 5th century, led to the decline of the Roman Empire. Well, what better way to vilify the Germans than to associate them with Attila the Hun, a barbarian, right? Not a civilized group of people. They're Huns. He is so angry. He's going to go down to the Marine Recruiting Office at 24 East 23rd Street this afternoon. And these posters were designed where you could customize them by location. This wasn't printed uh, with 24 East 23rd Street initially. It was printed and then that could be customized to your recruiting office in Tulsa or Los Angeles or Poto, wherever, wherever it might be. Very effective. The poster should be to the eye what the command is to the ear. Now, if you're recruiting young men into the services, if patriotism, if moral outrage doesn't get them to the recruiting office, how about adventure? Okay, you can become a Marine for two, three, or four years and you get to ride leopards wherever this is. So, I mean, yeah, we're talking about young men, not young women who have more sense. Young men, a sense of adventure. Okay? How about this one? Now, I love this image, but I included it because of what they are recruiting for, the tank corps. World War I is truly the first mechanized industrial war. Think of the armaments, the, the, the equipment used in World War I that was new. It had never been used before. Tanks, like we, we see here. The submarines that sunk the Lusitania, the Germans called U-boats. Airplanes, machine guns, high velocity artillery that could be fired and hit something over the horizon that you could not see and poison gas. This was industrialized killing on a scale that humans had never experienced. In the first five months of the war, the French army lost 754,000 men. The first five months of the war. They were using 19th century tactics of the bayonet charge against machine guns against artillery that had shrapnel that could blow you apart from 100, 200, 300 yards away. It took a long time for the tactics to catch up with the technology. So that's why I included this. Besides, I love cats. Uh, I've had cats that reacted this way, like on the 4th of July. <laughs> And then this is the ultimate adventure for a young man, is to ride a torpedo. Now, I mentioned you see many icons in these posters, but some of the images in the posters become icons. And if those of you that are fans of good movies, and I'm thinking of one from 1964, directed by Stanley Kubrick. Yeah. Now, I can't prove this, <laughs> but think of Dr. Strangelove and how I learned to stop worrying and love the bomb, and Slim Pickens dropping out of the airplane on the bomb. <laughs> this is it. And this is a few years before 1964. And if patriotism, moral outrage, and adventure aren't enough to attract young men to the service, sex always sells. And Chandler Christie did it better than anyone. These women that he uses in his posters become known as Christie girls. They're iconic representations of America, the virtue of America. And, and women in the audience today, how do, you, how do you react to this? Gee, I wish I were a man. I'd join the Navy. Be a man and do it. Okay? There's another, I, I, I have, wish I had more time. Uh, there's another one. It shows this beautiful woman just like this, and it's join the Navy. It's like, okay, here's my son, Matthew. You join the, the Navy, you get to serve with her. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> but sex is a very useful tool for the propagandist. Here's a much more subtle example, I think. Um, it's designed by a woman, obviously. Much more subtle example of a recruiting poster. 
give you a chance to look at the image. There's the icon, the American flag. On which side of the window are you? We see the troops marching in front of this young man. He's inside. He's in a suit. He's where it's safe. He's on the same side of the window as we are. Which side of the window are you on? And then this is in the exhibit. And notice the contrast. This is by Charles Dana Gibson, who was responsible for organizing these illustrators that are working on these propaganda posters. But he is of a generation before Montgomery Flagg of, of Howard Chandler Christie. And this poster looks like something from the 19th century, not something like this or this. But these are very targeted to specific audiences. Besides pushing buttons, these are very segmented to certain groups that they're trying to appeal to. This is not appealing to that young man. It's appealing to his mother and all mothers. And look, what, what, what do you see? Here he is, sir. We need him and you too. She's offering up her son. This is all about sacrifice and guilt if you're not willing to sacrifice pushing those buttons. This would appeal to very traditional, rural, perhaps, Americans. Um, so there's our recruiting. Now we're going to move to food conservation, conservation of resources. In August of 1917, President Wilson asked a fellow by the name of Herbert Hoover to take over or to run this new agency, the United States Food Administration. Hoover had been instrumental in feeding Belgians in the first couple years of the war. Very successfully brought food into Belgium, into France, to feed starving Europeans as a result of the war. Wilson asked Hoover to take over this, uh, this responsibility to help determine the production of food, the distribution of food. Hoover agreed, and he, he took this responsibility on and said, I do not want to be paid. I want the moral authority to ask Americans to voluntarily conserve food. Now, these posters can be very coercive, I will agree. Hoover um, worked primarily from the principle of this is a voluntary effort. We're not going to coerce people into saving food. The, the actual coercion came from your neighbors. If they saw that you were eating too much meat on Wednesday or you weren't saving bread or other wheat-based products, they may have given you a hard time. But Hoover didn't, and I, I respect his efforts for that. Again, iconography, the American flag, from those hats, uh, we know those are American soldiers, and this basket of food. America is the bread basket, the, the food supply of the world. Now, why is it important for Americans, people like you and I, to save food during the war years? Well, we have to feed our own army, but that's kind of a zero-sum game, and they were going to eat if they were here or if they were there. Primarily, we're raising food or saving food, conserving food, to feed people in Europe whose farmlands in France, if you've been watching the Tour de France the last few nights, France was the breadbasket of Europe. And it's devastated by war. So they can't grow and raise the food they needed. They depended upon the United States. This effort was so successful, Hoover's effort was so successful, that the United States tripled our food exports in the war years, tripled it, and most of that going to Europe to feed Europeans. Now, there were some negative consequences, and this is really, I, I risk going off on a tangent here, but all actions have a reaction, and as successful as this campaign was to not only produce more food, to, to conserve food, the negative consequence was that farmers were encouraged to plant fence row to fence row. Plant every square foot of land available. And that applied not only in, in traditional agricultural areas like the Midwest, but western Oklahoma, the panhandle of Oklahoma, where beginning in the war years, they began to turn the grass upside down, what the cowboys said, turning the grass upside down. They plowed it up took away that layer of natural grass that had been there for 
eons and turned it into wheat and, and corn and other grain. Well, they were really lucky that during the war years, it was in a wet cycle, produced lots of, of wheat and corn, made Oklahoma farmers very wealthy. But the natural cycle of the Great Plains returned in the 1930s to dry, hot, windy, and that layer of grass was no longer there, and that great soil blew away. So again, it's a discussion for another day, but this effort had some very negative consequences 20 years down the road. Some of the posters, save a loaf a week. Okay. This is very non-threatening compared to some of the posters we've already seen and some that you'll see. One of my favorite posters, recruiting children. Everyone has a role to play. Uh, this illustrator, Cushman Parker, he's the generation before Norman Rockwell. You know Norman Rockwell? Some of Cushman Parker's illustrations were on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post, and they typically had these little rosy-cheeked children. And here's this little boy saluting his bowl of corn mush. He's not going to eat wheat mush anymore. He's going to eat corn mush or rice mush. And now I know where my mother and my grandmother got the, the idea that you've got to clean your plate. You've got to be a member of the Clean Plate Club. You know, don't let any food go to waste. But that's one way to conserve it. Eat only what you need. Don't waste food. There are starving people in Belgium, in France, that need this food. Now, my mother, it was starving children in China. But now I know where this came from. As the war goes on, these posters become more grim. And this is a great example. This is in the exhibit. I love this illustration. You could take away all of the text and you still understand the anguish of a soldier and what they were going through. But now they've taken this food conservation and equated saving food to saving lives. And not just the lives of Belgians and French, but of American soldiers. And you see, and I'm not an art historian by any means, but what you see over the course of the war is how art changes in response to this cataclysmic event. And they become more severe, as you see here. And then something very different. Um, what comes out of the war effort is the Victory Garden. 1920 was the first American census that showed more people living in urban areas, in cities, than in rural areas. Well, throughout the 19th century, most of us lived on a farm or near farms. We either grew some portion of our food or it was very readily available. By this time, we're approaching that tipping point, most, many people were getting their food at grocery stores. Well, one way to send more food to Europe is to grow some of what you, you need. So even if you're in an urban environment, maybe even an apartment with a window box, you could grow some of your own food. So this is another one of these campaigns. This is the only other woman illustrator represented in my program. They were rare at the time. This is the younger sister of Frank Lloyd Wright. This is his sesquicentennial year. Um, so a very talented family, obviously. And now we're moving to the third group that I want to show you today, and that is the Liberty Loan Campaign. This is in the exhibit. It's like this soldier is confronting us directly. If you stand in front of he is looking at you and saying, come on, buy more bonds. And we see the iconography. We see a dead soldier. Is he an American or is he a German? He's a German. There's the Dickelhaub helmet. And we see the American, determined American soldier. His iconography is the helmet. That identifies him as a doughboy. Now, the Americans, when we entered the war, we didn't have a helmet. We got him from the British. That's actually a British helmet. But it comes identified as the American helmet. And, you, and you, I think you can see it in the poster. It's dented. This guy's been in combat. Well, these helmets were really important because this is a war that has shrapnel flying at you at the velocity of a bullet that will kill you. Uh, and the helmets, the caps they, they went into the war with were often leather. They didn't offer a lot of protection. So this war is a, a learning experience for the military on how to adjust literally on the fly to these new conditions. Come on, buy more liberal. He's doing his job. He's killing Germans. 
all of us on the home front, our job is to support his efforts. How do we do that? We buy Liberty Bonds. That poster is also leading us into this demonization, vilification of the Germans. This is an early uh, poster that, that tries to do that. It's one of the earliest that uses the word Hun in identifying the Germans. The Hun, his mark, it's the bloody hand. He's the aggressor, he's the person to fear. How can we help, how can we blot it out? By Liberty Bonds. Then they become a little more menacing. It's one thing that they're in Europe and doing their carnage over in Europe, but we want to keep those off the United States. Now, if you, were, if you haven't experienced or read the history of the war, those boots, they may not be recognizable to us in 2017. If you were alive in, 2000, in 1917, alive in 1917, you would have recognized the German Imperial Eagle, uh, the boots of maybe a German officer, the blood dripping off. Keep these off the USA. Let's beat them in, in Europe before they can come over across the Atlantic. But they become even more menacing. Here is the German soldier, the bloody hands, the blood dripping off the bayonet, identified by the Bickelhaub helmet. He's prone, laying prone across Europe. He's done his evil in Europe. He's looking across the Atlantic at us. We are his next victim. And these posters are creating a fear, not only a, a hatred of the German, but a fear of what Germany represents to American interest. How can we beat back the Hun? Liberty bonds will outspend them. And truly, it was a war of attrition, not only of men, but of material and of food. Well, we were becoming very wealthy as a result of the war. We were supplying the British, the French, before we entered the war. They're buying material from us. We're loaning them the money to buy it from us. Uh, our manufacturing capacity greatly increases as a result of the war. We can outspend them, but we need your help to do that by Liberty Bonds. And then the ultimate example of what will happen if we don't defeat them in Europe, they're gonna be here. This is New York Harbor, the Statue of Liberty. New York City in the background is in flames as a result of the aerial bombardment of German planes. And notice the Statue of Liberty is headless. Her head is down here. That's pretty grim. Now, back to our movies. Back to our movies, how this becomes iconic. There was a movie, it was one of the first movies I was allowed to see alone without my parents in 1969. I'm dating myself. I don't know if I snuck off to see this or what. But one of the scenes in this movie is very much like this. Planet of the Apes. Okay, so there's another movie to go see. Dr. Strangelove, Planet of the Apes. Actually, I guess there's a new Planet of the Apes movie coming out. Notice, besides the image, a very powerful image, what they've done, they're looking back, suggesting with this reference from Lincoln's Gettysburg Address that liberty shall not perish from the earth. That's powerful. That's a powerful poster for something completely different and less threatening. Children are often used. We all love children. We want to protect their future. How can we do that? We'll buy liberty loans, buy the bonds. But this one is working at a very kind of manipulative level. My daddy bought me a government bond. Did yours? Imagine the parent, their child comes home crying and, and it proclaims, Susie's daddy bought her a liberty bond and I don't have one. <laughs> Think about that kind of parental pressure. Where'd I go? I get so excited. Um, so again, children used in, in very manipulative ways. This is not aimed at that child, really. It's aimed at her parents. And I'll, I'll point out, throughout you've seen First Liberty Loan, Second Liberty Loan, Third Liberty Loan, Fourth Liberty Loan. There were four Liberty Loan campaigns or offerings of these bonds. 
first begins in April, the last one is in the, the last months of 1918, and then there will be a fifth, and we'll see some examples of that, the victory loan campaign after the war had ended. Here's another poster using children. Again, if you were alive in 1917, you recognized who that man was. That was John Blackjack Pershing, the commander of the American Expeditionary Force that led the American troops to Europe. Here we have this suggestion that these children can help him win by saving and serving, by buying war saving stamps. Well, children don't have $50 to go buy a Liberty Bond, but they do have 25 cents, and they can buy a stamp, and over time they can buy enough stamps and put them in their little savings book and redeem those first for a $5 coupon, and later, if they get enough, for a $50 bond. Everybody has a role to play, even children with their quarters, or maybe Americans that weren't so well off, because $50 in 1917, 1918 was pretty much the average weekly pay of an American. But here's a way for children to participate. Besides cleaning their plate, they can buy a savings stamp. Here's another one of these that is very, controversial then and even today. Are you 100% American? Prove it. And the accompanying uh, quote that I have there is from Secretary of the Treasury William McAdoo. A man who can't lend his government $1.25 at the rate of 4% is not entitled to be an American citizen. This is tying citizenship to your participation in these different uh, campaigns. I often suggest to my students that the rights we hold most dear, First Amendment, freedom of expression, are never threatened more than when we are at times of war. It is truly a balancing act. We need unity. We need to come together to face a threat. But often these rights are suppressed. If you were against the war, if you were against the draft, you risked imprisonment during World War I. First there was the Espionage Act, but the Sedition Act. If you were against the war, against the draft, and you made that a, a, public, a public statement to that effect, you could be put in, in prison, as Eugene Debs was, socialist uh, leader at the time. It happened, lots of Americans. If you're an immigrant, how can you prove you're an American? buy a Liberty Bond. Maybe you're a German-American and you've, your family traces its history in the United States back for generations. You may need to prove that you're 100% American. So again, I mentioned earlier, this campaign creates an environment that will breed hysteria and often very pointed persecution. Back to Howard Chandler Christie. I'll let you look at this for a moment. This is after the, the armistice has been signed in, in November 11th, 1918, the Victory Liberty Loan Campaign. The war is over, but we still have some expenses that we need to, to uh, recover. Who is this targeting? Who is the target market that this poster is appealing to? Immigrants. We have Americans all. This is a very different message than this one. Americans all. And this beautiful woman representing the United States, Columbia, with her wreath, has an honor roll. And look at those names. They're all immigrant names. Irish, English, uh, Czech, uh, Greek, Italian, Spanish, Polish, uh, Jewish. What's missing? There are no German surnames on that list. Again, German Americans were truly vilified along with Germans fighting uh, the Allied powers. Uh, Charles Myers related a story. He grew, he grew up in La Mesa, Texas, out in West Texas. And there was a baker in town. He was of German descent. And there were rumors spread that this baker, maker of bread, was putting glass shards in his bread. He wasn't. Help decrease his business. And, and that's a mild example. That's a mild example. 
But yes, it's very targeted to immigrants. Here's one that we saw an earlier example of a woman handing over her son. Again, the target market is women. Help America's sons win this war. And this is an interesting illustration. Look at the background. There's carnage and, and just the, the worst excesses of battle, ships sinking, uh, soldiers dead on the ground. And here we have this very motherly figure, her arms open, like she's asking for more sons for this. But notice what the illustrator has done, at least my interpretation. What does that look like? It's a halo. A very saintly mother willing to sacrifice her son. And, and I've included several that show how women were depicted. The first example here, uh, this motherly figure. Here is a young woman, strong, independent. This United War work campaign was planned and it did kick off on November 11th, 1918. They didn't know at the time the armistice was gonna be signed on that day, but it was a campaign of American social groups to raise $170 million for the war effort during this two-week campaign. It started November 11th, 1918. It was comprised of the Jewish Welfare Board, the Knights of Columbus, the YMCA, the YWCA, the Salvation Army, and it's taking place in workplaces, raising funds. And why a woman, this young woman? Well, because women were asked to fill the roles of men in factories and farms. Uh, because the men, in many cases, were off in Europe fighting. So it's a very positive uh, depiction of women. When you see women depicted as Europeans, they are victims in many of these posters. This poster is in the exhibit. Must children die and mothers plead in vain? The earlier example we saw, remember Belgium, the young girl is a victim. In contrast to the American woman, strong, independent. And then the final poster I have for you, it's again one of my favorite. This is from the very last campaign, the Victory Liberty Loan Campaign. This uh, illustrator, Garrett Benneker, he said he took the working man as his model. That for these campaigns to be successful, they would depend upon the working man. There's more of them, or working people, I should say, in 2017. Uh, he said man. But there are more of them out there than there are the very wealthy. So we need to appeal to them. So his model, maybe he's a farmer, maybe he's a mechanic, Sure, we'll finish the job. The war's over, there are still expenses, and what's he doing? He's reaching into his pocket to buy more bonds. But this guy, again, there's iconography, we may not recognize it, but he has four pens. He has bought bonds for the four loan campaigns, the first, second, third, and fourth, and he's reaching into his pocket for a fifth. So he's the good American, He's doing his duty, and he's saying, if you haven't, why not? Not verbally, but that's the subconscious kind of message that's going out here. I love that the, the, the art, is, it's very painterly, uh, just a wonderful, one of my favorite in the exhibit. And for my final example today, it's not a poster at all, it's the only object from our collection in the exhibit. It's always been one of my favorite works in the museum's collection by John Singer Sargent, one of the premier American artists of the late 19th, early 20th century. It's the arrival of American troops at the front. And he actually was in Europe. He was an eyewitness to the arrival of troops and so forth. In this particular instance, they are literally at the front. You see the Americans here and they are marching towards the front where the British soldiers that they are relieving, soldiers that have been on the front lines for maybe four years, and look how battered and beat up they are compared to the fresh uh, troops, the American troops. Notice the landscape, it's battle blasted. 
Well, that, this, is, this is a great painting on that level. It, it is an eyewitness kind of documentation of really what was occurring at this moment in time. But I think he's also suggesting, as a metaphor, it's not only the Americans replacing the British at the front, it's the Americans replacing them as the next world power. Now, we just celebrated on Tuesday our 241st Independence Day. Well, 100 years ago, this past Tuesday, American troops were arriving in France under the command of Black Jack John Pershing. We saw his image earlier. Upon his arrival in France, he made his way to Paris, and on the 4th of July, 1917, he made his way to a small cemetery outside of Paris where he visited the grave of a very important French citizen, and there he made a promise to the French nation. It was delivered in French by one of his uh, staff officers, and I'll read it. It's the, my one note I'll need today. I don't trust myself. I may break up as I read this. It is with loving pride we drape the colors in tribute of respect to this citizen of your great republic. And here and now, in the presence of the illustrious dead, we pledge our hearts and our honor in carrying this war to a successful issue. Lafayette, we are here. Thank you, that's my point of view. I'll be glad to take any questions you may have. Again, if you would like to join me in the galleries afterwards, uh, we'll do so. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Yes? Um, what happened to, I'm not sure I get the name right, the Committee for Public Information? Did that morph into something else, or was it... Well, we, I guess we could say that, it, that eventually its influence was carried forward, but the actual Committee on Public Information was uh, shut down, ended its, its mission in late 1919. If, if I'm a tomato farmer in Iowa, and that tomato is supposed to go to Belgium, how do they keep that tomato from going bad before going to Belgium? Well, actually, by this time, there was refrigerated shipping, right? and you could ship things, but primarily what is going to Belgium, to France, is wheat to make bread, so that's easily shipped without deterioration, or meat, primarily beef and pork, and that could be uh, canned. The very, I, I don't know that tomatoes were a big part of it, but, but if you grew more tomatoes, I could eat tomatoes as part of my expanding diet. And that's it's a great question because part of what this food campaign does is change the American diet. And not just during the war years, but moving forward. We begin to eat more rice as a result. We weren't big rice eaters before the war. After, during and then after the war, we, began, we began to eat more rice. We began to eat more chicken as a substitute for beef. We find very inventive ways for leftovers. We don't want to waste them. So how can we you know, make two or three meals out of, out of the first meal? Thank you. All right, well, thank you. Oh, yes, sir. Female sailor. Right now, the Navy's fussing about the red stripes on uniforms, indicating that it was uh, bad behavior for a certain period of time, as opposed to the gold stripes. I'm trying to get rid of the red stripes. I wonder if you put the red stripes on her for the same reason. Uncle Bob's. <laughs> you know, I don't know, but I'll tell you this: as you as you study these, they didn't put anything on there by accident whether it's stripes on a uniform or a pickle hob helmet on a German or a bushy mustache or whatever it is, everything is placed for a reason. These are symbols, they're emblems, uh, they're these icons that have meaning. Uh, 
So I, I'm, I'm certainly not qualified to answer that question, but I suspect there's a reason that there are certain color, the, the uniforms that uh, Mr. Myers has loaned to the exhibit, uh, those uniforms have insignia that mean something. There's a certain stripe that means that you served in Europe versus here in the United States, or you had an honorable discharge. You know, so everything has a, has a reason, has meaning. Yes? Well, I'm not suggesting that a poster does. I mean, just propaganda in general. And so much propaganda today, at least from my experience, is based on the internet. So we can go find a point of view, I'll use that term versus propaganda, that appeals to whatever uh, kind of conspiracy or, or point of view, whether it's truthful or not, that, that we can find. Now the posters, and thank you for letting me uh, maybe clarify this, I would argue that the posters reached their zenith as a form of mass communication during World War I. Because what will happen afterwards is radio, great tool of mass communication, Film, great tool of mass communication, and uh, in the years after World War One, uh, World War Two, the television, and today the internet. Yes. Uh, Mark, uh, it, it occurs to me because of the companion exhibit that we've got. Um, I didn't see any African Americans in any of these posters. Did they? Did they use them in some of the World War One posters? Yes, and those examples are in the black bodies, uh, uh, the art of the war poster. Um, I intentionally, because I knew we were going to have the black bodies exhibit, I intentionally did not include any uh, or even consider any in the Power of Posters exhibit. And there are two exhibits and there are companions. They, hopefully they complement one another. But I'll also tell you that within the McFarland collection, I didn't find any with black bodies. But intentionally, if you begin in the black bodies exhibit, which I think most people would, that's the first one they encounter, you're in that exhibit and you turn the corner and you're confronted with this very different kind of poster. There, so that was intentional on my part. But yes, there were. Again, it's very, it's segmented marketing. Those posters in black bodies are, are targeting a very specific audience. There's one post, thank you, Dana, because it allows me to go off on a tangent. Um, there's a great poster in that Black Bodies exhibit. It shows a little baby, a little black baby, and it's you know, buy a war bond for her future. I have an example, I have it in my office, not up here, but there's a, a poster with a white baby that is exactly the same other than the child being depicted. It's a different market. I, there may be a, a poster with a Jewish child, with a Catholic child, who knows. These efforts were very targeted. Very targeted. Thank you.